enjoyed it. Um, it's now my pleasure to hand over to Councillor Bernadette Thomas, who will be hosting the next session. Thank you. We're going to play a bit of musical chairs up the front um, and we'll get our ducks in a row. One of our panellists is actually coming in online. Um, and Barvin, if you would like to come up the front. Josh, I've lost you. Where have you gone? Oh, there you are, right in front of me. Um, uh, now, having sat down the back, I know that if you you can't see so well down the back, so I might ask you, panellists, please, would you mind standing up for this? And you can each have a microphone. Yep, on the screen. Uh, yes. All right. Yep. All right. Thanks, Jane, for orchestrating that. All right. You right to hold that? You, or you yeah, okay. Great. Um, yeah, so I'm Councillor Bernadette Thomas. I'm a councillor at Maribyrnong City Council. So I'm going to facilitate the next discussion, which is a panel discussion looking at a variety of on demand bus services operating in Melbourne and the surrounds. Um, I'm glad somebody brought up the 472. I live on a, on a corner of a main road and I have the 472 and the 223 and the 223 is hands down better than the 472. So just a tip if you live, if you're gonna to move to Yarraville. Um, <laughs> and uh, just wanna shout out to Melissa Falkenberg who's unwell. I'm pretty sure she's on the streaming in today but she was um, supposed to be hosting. So I hope Mel, you're feeling a bit better. So. Uh, to introduce our three speakers. Firstly, we've got Councillor Josh uh, Gillingham, who was the first elected to Wyndham Council in 2016. He served as mayor for the 2019-20 term, and this is his second term on council. And Josh tells us he's keen to use this council term to continue his work in building a livable city, not just a big city, which Wyndham, as we all know, is one of the biggest in Melbourne. Um, Josh's focus is on making it easier for residents to raise a family, work locally, and have all the necessary amenities close to home. He holds the city design portfolio, focusing on establishing policies to create more livable, better designed and well-connected neighbourhoods through mixed land use, different housing types and greater access to quality public transport. That's good to hear. And it also focuses on ways to manage growth and ensure that development is sustainable. So welcome, Josh. Uh, Eng, I hope you can hear us. Good. Yes, um, that's okay. Good. Eng, so Eng Lim is currently the Manager of Engineering and Resource Recovery at Macedon Rangers Shire Council. He's worked for the past 33 years for both public and private sectors across three continents in Australia, Middle East, India, United Kingdom, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia and Thailand. I'm a bit tired after that. Uh, Eng has strong, diverse experience in managing various infrastructure projects, including large township, township master planning, privatisation of tolled highways, strategic planning and precinct structure planning, public transport and bus priority studies, road safety, parking, traffic management, waste and resource recovery and axle load studies. So welcome, Eng. And last but not least, of course, we have Barvin Mehta, who is a traffic and transport engineer and a project manager and currently the manager of city infrastructure planning at Melton City Council. And he's worked in traffic and transportation areas for 14 years. Barvin's experience includes transport planning and modelling, econometric data modelling, infrastructure pipeline planning, precinct structure planning, land use planning and development contributions program management within the public and private sectors. In his current role, he looks after the engineering design and construction approvals of developer delivered works, infrastructure pipeline and capital works programming, as well as strategic planning, transport planning. And he also innovates and tinkers. So maybe think about a question for, about uh, his tinkering later. So this is how it's <laughs> gonna work. We've got our three uh, panelists and a warning, you have four minutes each and Jane is going to be our timekeeper. Uh, and then, we'll, of course, we'll open up to questions from the floor and, and online. So I'm going to ask uh, Josh if you'd like to speak first. Great. Well, first of all, thanks very much for having me, uh, Bernard, and to Jane as well. Uh, and I just want to start by saying to the, the man in the white polo, uh, in the city of Wyndham, I wish we had trees. So we have the lowest tree canopy in any LGA anywhere in this country. Uh, that just goes to show... Uh, the level of impact in terms of uh, greenfield development that's occurring out there in Melbourne's west. It's quite an extraordinary issue that goes a lot to livability. 
I missed uh, most of your presentation, Dr Stone, I apologise, but at the tail end I thought I'd make a comment with regards to something that I understand is underway in the state at the moment, which I'm sure will give a lot of you a sense of optimism around investment uh, in terms of bus routes and more importantly in bus services. Uh, we understand uh, that the government, the state, is looking to release uh, some $200 million out of a specific fund that is ultimately paid for through the growth areas infrastructure levy. I'm not quite sure if anyone knows what that is, but essentially uh, when there's development that's occurring in greenfield developments across our city, developers pay a tax per hectare uh, and Spring Street has been collecting it for quite some years and it's been piling up for quite some years, hundreds of millions of dollars that sit in this fund. Uh, and we know that DTP, the Department of Transport and Planning, are looking at releasing a significant amount of that for new bus routes uh, as part of uh, a December announcement uh, in terms of spending that money. Uh, and if you look at the criteria, I think it's called the New Communities Fund, the criteria was recently changed uh, in about 2016, 2017, to allow for the first five years of any new bus route to be funded directly out of this fund, as opposed to being funded through the normal state budget process. And that was essentially designed to deal with the problem of not having enough money, but looking at new sort of start-up, if you will, um, of uh, you know, kicking, kicking a particular route off, testing it in terms of demand, and then ultimately, I understand the objective would be after five years to build it into recurrent spending in terms of a state budget. So in the city of Wyndham, we expect some of that money in December to go towards some uh, new bus routes in our city, fingers crossed. If I can give you a bit of a, a broader picture of the city of Wyndham, we are expected to be about half a million people in population by 2040, uh, the size of Canberra. Uh, we are significantly growing at a rate of some 15,000 people each and every year. The median age uh, in my city is 31. So think about that in terms of the sort of growth in population, but equally, uh, we've got pretty much, a, it's not a baby boom, it's a millennial boom going on uh, out in the city of Wyndham. And that's pretty significant in terms of one of the topics that I'm here to discuss with you today, and that is the f flexi ride service that we operate in Tarnit, which I don't know you might have mentioned. Um, and essentially, I sort of call it the bus Uber app. Um, it's really designed to encourage people to not only uh, seek a service in terms of an existing uh, service area, so there's uh, an area in Tarni, which I'm sure I'll get questions on this, um, where you can simply open your app, get picked up through this flexi ride service that's funded via the state and dropped off uh, at the location um, that's of most preference to you and you sort of use the app. Uh, we can go through that in more detail shortly. Uh, really important because it's got a whole heap of unintended benefits. We're talking about a millennial population that can build that into their everyday living, uh, and as a result, become more attuned to the idea of using public transport as opposed to car dependency, with some 91% of households being dependent on cars. How does that sound, Jane? Perfect. Well timed, thank you. And I'm sure that there'll be some questions about the flexi ride from a couple of people in the audience. Uh, Eng, we might go to you now just to talk to us about um, Masson and Rangers On Demand Service. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about the uh, on demand flexi ride in uh, Wooden. So, Wooden is a relatively, uh, it's a defined as a district town uh, in our shire, which is well served by the train station uh, on Wooden Station itself. And the population growth, uh, similar to what Councillor Joshua mentioned, the population growth has been dramatic in the sense that it doubled in the last 10 years. Um, and uh, the flexi ride in Wooden uh, was actually started, in terms of the advocacy, started sometime in 2016 uh, through a very strong push from our local uh, politicians. So therefore, uh, that highlights the importance of strong advocacy by councillors and all that, So, which is great because Councillor Bernadette Commerce is also a councillor in Melbourne now, so that's a key point there. Uh, and uh, the flexi ride is typically designed as a uh, to serve routes that are of low patronage, which does not support the normal PTV kind of uh, services. Uh, so in the um, so since 2016, uh, it has been slowly, slowly growing, uh, 
and the service is basically on demand. So you can either uh, call up uh, PDV by a certain number or you can use download the Flexi app. Uh, and what we have found is uh, they have launched a, a trial for the last 12 months on the app. And in my discussion with DTP, who manages the app and the service, the community in our area is not so hands-on on the app. They prefer the, uh, the, the phone call. So that's the sort of uh, uh, initial feedback from, uh, from, from the residents. Uh, and the other part is, of course, those who are having mobility issues, they can actually pre-book a service and, and then they can get uh, access to those uh, services. It is a cash service. It's not one of those Mikey type. Uh, and tickets are available from uh, from the driver of the bus. So, so that's basically. I'm not sure whether I'm okay in terms of time or not. Yes, well done. Thank you. Oh, saving, thank you. Saving us a little bit of time there. Uh, thanks, Eng. Yep. So we'll go to you're right, um, Barbin, who's going to talk about on-demand services in Milton. Is that Hello. Yep. Um, I wasn't prepared for a four-minute speech, but just to break the ice, uh, Councillor Josh, uh, I'm a Wyndham resident and I work at Melton. Do you know how many Melton residents come to Wyndham uh, via public transport to work or, or pleasure? Difficult going outwards if you're getting on the train. I don't know. You tell me. Uh, according to Vista Survey data, zero. There you go. Going All right. in and out. <laughs> okay. Now, now on the bus services for Melton. Um, so Melton has about 47 routes and our 48th route is getting implemented right now. Only five of uh, our bus routes, 48 bus routes, meet the minimum service level criteria. So they all run at 40 minute services or longer. So some of them are 60 minutes and 120 minutes frequency. Uh, clearly not cater for the growth that we are uh, we are experiencing at the moment. Uh, Melton is a classic tale of two cities uh, divided by vast amounts of land, land, empty land in the middle, which is getting filled up. Um, so we got Melton on the western side, and we got Caroline Springs on the eastern side. We got some really decent bus routes on Caroline Springs that were they got, they got sort of streamlined, and through evidence and data, we can demonstrate that those streamlined bus routes with 20 minutes frequency or less they are actually performing really well over the last five years. Versus uh, over time, when population grew in Melton side on the western side. Um, the uh, the bus route got further diluted and diluted to extend into newer estates and so on. So the travel time increased substantially as well as the frequency uh, sort of went down from 30 minutes to 40 minutes to 45 minutes and so on. And those bus routes have consistently gone down in patronage. Uh, on the, on the, so, so Melton has prepared a, an advocacy uh, platform called movingmelton.com.au which sort of covers all the buses side of things. and. The work is pretty much aligned with what John, uh, Professor John uh, Stone and his team has done, uh, very similar to uh, sort of a Melton-specific analysis uh, in a bit more detail. On the flexibus side, uh, we do have a flexibus area, which is, we've been told, one of the largest service area. It's 21 square kilometers, and there are only four buses uh, or four vehicles to serve 18,000 residents in that area. Now, I'm putting 18,000 mildly because the, at the rate we are growing and, and the, 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 experience, uh, the growth experience that we are having in that area is the fastest. So this 18,000 will go up to uh, 46,000 people by 2031, so just in 10 years. And, and we are in the two, two years mark since the service was introduced. So the population has gone probably from 18,000 gone up by another four or five grand already. Um, uh, just to service uh, those many people with four, four, four peak services uh, is just clearly not enough. So that's where we are experiencing some anecdotal evidences from our community that they wait for flexibuses forever and they get cancelled. So if they pre-book, they get cancelled. If they try and book in a peak time, they don't get a booking at all. Uh, average, work, average booking time is around 22 minutes, uh, waiting time is around 22 to 30 minutes and then they also experience cancellations as well after that, a risk of cancellation. Uh, one minute, all right. Um, the other stat sort of I wanna throw uh, is that we got about, again, just looking at the data from the ABS census and so on, we got about 21,000 people living and working locally and in from this area, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, 20, 21,000 in the 
entire Melton. From, from this area, if you, if you look at 18,000 people, maybe about 6,000 in the workforce, how many uses these buses? 20. That's 0.2%, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. All right, I'm just gonna pop that down so I can see. Um, well, thank you. There was a lot in that, everybody. We might give them a quick clap before we ask do some questions. Um, so I'm going to go to the, the, the theme question for the day. Um, if you're renegotiating bus contracts, what single metric would you add? Um, I'm going to... Do you want to go first? Because you've been here all day and that will give the other two a chance uh, to catch up. Have you been here all day? I, I just came in. Oh, did you? Sorry. OK, well, I'll read it again. If you are renegotiating bus contracts, what single metric would you add? It will be the connectivity. Oh, good answer, John Stone thinks. <laughs> that was his answer earlier. Good. Eng, what do you think? Uh, frequency. Mm -hmm. If it's a single metrics, then it would be the frequency. Yep. Because research have shown that if the bus is not frequent enough, no one will use it because we are competing against private vehicles. So there's already an inherent disadvantage of bus versus private vehicles. So if you don't have the right frequency, there's, there's no way. And I think that is reflected by, by Bavin's comment about the size of the growth of, of uh, his council and then the lack of usage by, by in uh, public transport. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. And Josh? Well, there isn't much room to go once you take those two <laughs> options. Probably choice. Uh, if you take the point I've been making around the flexi ride service, the choice of taking a more conventional bus route as opposed to uh, an app-based um, mm. proposition of on-demand, so choice. Yep, okay. Connectivity, frequency and choice. I'm going to throw over to the audience for questions now or online. Maybe I'll stand next to Bob. Do we have any qu Who's got a question? Oh, sorry, Laura, I couldn't see you. Thanks, Jean. <laughs> Thanks, Bernadette. Thanks to the panellists. Um, my name's Laura. I think you're relatively recently come in the room. Is Flexibus fit for purpose in your respective councils? Tough question. Uh, okay, Josh, it looks like you're ready to go. Uh, well, I, th I think a measure of that is how well is the service that we're trying right now going. Uh, there's about 1,200 people per week using the Flexi Ride Service. There have been instances where we've had people turn back uh, based on the level of demand. So, in my opinion, uh, it's clearly meeting all of the indicators about a service that meets the needs of the community. It's a localised solution. Uh, and as I mentioned, I think so much of that goes to the type of target public you've got in a city like mine. And when you're talking about an average age of 30, the take-up rate using an app that's directly in the household, there's all of those benefits that come with that option, which I'm sure will be fascinating in future studies to see what sort of attitudinal change does that create as well in terms of perception of use of public transport as opposed to car dependency. And I made the point before in relation to my city that you know some 91% of households indicate that they depend upon a car for transport um, in terms of mainstream. Uh, what does that look like in the future, I think, will be another fascinating point. So directly to your question, um, I think uh, demand is clearly the major metric for us in terms of whether it's fit for purpose. Uh, and the feedback we've heard thus far is the entry points of people being able to get it easily and get to their destination. It's all been very positive feedback, except for those that were turned away. Great. Thanks, Barvin. Do you want to go next? Yep. Uh, so for Melton, it's a different story. Uh, obviously, it's a very large service area. Um, and the way the, the, sort of the service area has been designed, you can only travel from resident to the hub location because the service is, get, is funded by GAG. And, and Obviously, gag charge area, it only is meant to service the residents within the gag charge area. So anyone outside of it can't use it. So just try and restrict it. They, they sort of, it's a funny little shape that they've designed. Um, what it has demonstrated over the last couple of years is that uh, it, it has demonstrated a need for a, a fixed route service for our community. Thanks. Eng? Oh. <laughs> That's true. I don't think they can. We, I don't think we want to get a into that. A sinkhole opens up, <laughs> and they fall into it. Uh, so, 
Good question. Eng? Ah, yes. So to the question about um, fit for purpose, so the flexi ride in Wood End at this point in time is relatively fit for purpose in the sense that the patronage level is uh, relatively low compared to a full service uh, bus route uh, and therefore it's okay to a certain extent. What uh, we have been hearing from our residents is that currently the the what they call the hours are only in the between eight something to about four something from Monday to Friday, which means there are no service on weekend or public holidays. So that's the expansion of service that I think can be improved. Uh, so so I think that's probably the the next step in the evolution of the flexi ride. Ultimately, with population growth, I foresee that you know if the patronage level goes up, um, the service is throughout uh, the whole week, uh, seven days a week then at some point in the future, it should be able to convert into uh, a, a full service, obviously with tweaking of the route itself, yeah. Thanks, so yeah, so uh, some challenges definitely across the three systems that, uh, yeah, di different but similar, I think, challenges. Um, and we've heard today about, sorry, I'm just gonna butt in, we've heard today about accessibility, so I'm a little interested in how just kind of continuing that conversation about fit for purpose. What, how do we, how do we service people who have accessibility needs? So maybe Josh, you wanna hmm. talk first? I think the, the biggest problem we've got, Bernadette, is uh, you've got estates right now that are developed out um, and have absolutely no bus routes funded. So that there's uh, no service, sorry. So there's no service that's actually funded in terms of the estate. So from an accessibility point of view, if there's no service to begin with, uh, then obviously it's an accessibility issue for all types of demographic. Um, but, you know, I guess in reality, this talks to the lack of interrelationship between planning on a strategic level where, um, you know, councils are not uh, necessarily able to have interventions around uh, prohibiting development uh, outside of a certain um, meterage away from public transport nodes. This is always a contemporary challenge. I'm sure I'm speaking to the choir here, preaching to the choir here in terms of this problem uh, as a decision maker. When you see estates being developed out, uh, there is, um, you know, provision for uh, bus routes, but the services are eons away. Um, so I think from an accessibility point of view, that's a problem. Uh, probably just touching on your point around the service being fit for purpose in terms of Tane, that's probably another aspect as to why our service is quite popular as well. It is the only option sometimes, depending on where you are uh, within the suburbs. So um, that's probably how I'd respond to that. Thanks. Thanks. Eng, do you want to talk to us about any accessibility issues or how your that service sort of um, provides full accessibility for people? Yeah, if you're talking about accessibility for those who have mobility issues, I covered mm. that because the, 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 the demand responsive transport like FlexiRide do have a tailor-made approach if uh, a customer uh, make a special phone call to record for such such service. But if you're looking at accessibility in terms of uh, being able to access in terms of distance and all that, I think that's something that needs to be improved further. And I think I do take councillor's point about uh, strategic planning because in 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 areas where transport planning is always uh, in terms of best practices, we always look at try to concentrate uh, higher development or population growth around uh, train stations because train stations, are, for example, in the case of Wooden and I'm sure along Melton, there's a lot of train stations there. Uh, we can try to encourage higher density development, not necessarily you know, skyscrapers, but four to five story kind of development um, around train station within walking distance. So what I meant is within four to 800 meters walking distance so that we can create that uh, critical mass of, of users uh, to public transport and rather than try to rely on another uh, the bus service. So there's that, that cohesive approach to, uh, to uh, public transport from making use of the bus uh, train and in, in, in some places, tram, yeah, which doesn't apply to us, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Uh, for Melton, I think it has significantly improved the accessibility. The number is infinity mm. because there was none, um, like Councillor Josh said. Um, 
Uh, there is an area called Thornhill Park, which has been in the uh, news and media for a long time. Uh, only had one road access in and out onto the onto the freeway, and that's it, and no other sort of sealed road connection. So there are some farm roads in there, and they they are about six thousand plus residents in the in the area with no they had no service. So given that this service is accessible to them, that has a significant improvement on their lives. Uh, having said that. Uh, at about 3,000 trips a month uh, on four buses, uh, probably about 100 trips a day on peak day. Uh, that's 25 trips per bus. That's nothing in the mm. scheme of things. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Um, on that. No, no, because we've got We're another question. We're going to go question. to another question. You talk too long. <laughs> 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 oh. yeah, sorry. Yes, um, Councillor McNeil Whitehorse, we're, we're uh, one of the We've been classified as an inner city uh, a council area now and uh, we've also got the uh, 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 Box Hill being classified as a second city. And uh, within the planning scheme, uh, the planning is now that uh, they, they don't provide any, um, any sort of um, uh, um, vehicle... Parking? Uh, parking within 400 metres of um, yeah. public transport. So uh, yep. that's a, another yep. challenge for people with, you know, mobility issues. Yep. Thanks, Amanda. We've got another question. Oh, did the... Um, yep, Laura has gone, popped out. Mm, yes, yes. Hey, Ross Savage, um, Bus Network Planner at VLC. Um, this is quite aimed, I guess, towards outer council network planning. One of the biggest challenges is with bus service, particularly local bus services, we're trying to connect people to shopping centres and to high capacity services such as rail. Much of Melbourne, shopping centres and new suburbs are not located anywhere near rail. So Caroline Springs, great example. Is there any consideration that councils are giving towards changing some of these land uses to say get supermarkets located near rail stations for trip chaining? Yep. That sort of thing. Yes. Okay. Oh, Eng looks like he's ready to go. Yes, that's a very good question because I think what you mentioned earlier about the, pra the current practice is correct. Uh, in the case of not in Sri Woodend, but in uh, in um, in Gisborne, another the major township within Macedon Rangers, we are actually looking at a a, a, a new uh, structure plan called Gisborne Futures, where there is a train station further north in Gisborne North, and there's a piece of land that is uh, has huge potential for for development. So what we have done together with uh, engineering and uh, strategic planners is look at how we can make a second. Uh, so-called uh, medium density development with shopping, with supermarkets and uh, and four-storey uh, apartments and dwelling units above. So they are quite compact development. We can cut down our number of vehicles uh, per, per apartment. So for example, the plane scheme may require two parking. We may bring it down to one just to allow that accessibility as commented by uh, the earlier uh, a member. Uh, so that's one option. So we are looking to that at the moment uh, in the case of Gisborne. So where where practical. Having said that, we haven't tested the actual market, you know, the developers and their attitudes and and, and the actual market. Are they, I don't, is there a market for that in, in the outer regions? In the inner cities, I think definitely there's a very good example, many, many examples everywhere. Um, but we haven't really tested that further out into the uh, more, I wouldn't say rural, very urban areas, yeah. Josh or Barvin, either? Okay, Barvin, you go here. Uh, I think my question is going to be it's around 50 50 on this. Um, so, it, it, through the Victorian Planning Authority and development of structure plans and so on, where possible, there are major activity centers along the rail corridor, so such as Mount Atkinson, as an example, uh, that was raised earlier in John's um, speech. Um, that has a major activity center right on the train station. Uh, where, but on the other side, we have Rockbank North, major town center that is getting developed three and a half kilometers away from the train station, again, highlighting the need for a high quality 
bus route uh, that feeder service that connects to both. Uh, and in future as well, like we got Melton East, PSP coming through War uh, Warrensbrook and a few others that will not have a direct, um, like a major center close to a train station. They will all be located further away. Well, look, I'd probably respond by saying I think every resident, whether they know this or not, subliminally or otherwise, would be incredibly grateful for the intergenerational decision of the regional rail link in my city uh, because we have the opposite uh, issue of Melton in that uh, we are in the fight of our lives on prime land use in and around these major designated uh, transport activity areas. And I say that because we're currently in the Supreme Court right now uh, on a matter in which was uh, the subject of public scrutiny last week uh, in The Age uh, in relation to a site at a train station where we're currently fighting quite hard to uphold the underlying principles in the Victorian Planning Authority um, or growth, uh, the old um, term that was given for the state agency in terms of the precinct structure plan. And so what do I mean by that? Uh, so we, um, uh, through a councillor-led overturning of a um, resolution, uh, opposed uh, a, um, a subdivision of about 200 townhouses uh, directly on land opposite a train station. We argued uh, effectively that this is, if there were ever a moment to build medium density development in the outer suburbs, this is it, uh, making sure that you've got, uh, if, I don't know if anyone knows this example, the Williams Landing Master Plan uh, is a perfect blend of how you create commercial residential and ultimately good high quality livability in the outer suburbs. And we often laugh at the opposite problem that we hear about in inner city councils when they debate the idea of high density in terms of uh, respective applications and what they may mean for um, their neighbourhoods. We have the opposite. We want to invite that because it deals with the issue of the urban sprawl and all of the sort of interrelationships we're talking about nuanced here. If you've got people that have to ultimately get to a train station uh, through a, a bus route that doesn't exist in order to get to work in the city, we're kind of failed, right? So I think uh, mm. in the sense that we're still not dealing with trying to create a localised economy where there's local jobs uh, and people are within that 20-minute uh, walking uh, opportunity, which is um, so integral. So uh, for us, we have probably a, a much greater luck uh, than Melton, and you'll see that, I think, in terms of livability indicators over the next decade or uh, and beyond. Um, but it also comes down to the decisions uh, and, can I say, the support of the state in supporting councils like mine, because quite quite often, and I'm happy to be somewhat political on this because I can be as a councillor, it's very frustrating to see in the housing statement so much interest around uh, the suburban rail loop and creating precincts around uh, transport nodes and train stations, but then not give any care in the world uh, about the outer suburbs that have the exact same proposition. Uh, but of course, we're not in marginal seats, are we? So I think that's really the challenge for us is saying, well, how can you have the exact same policy proposition saying that it's really important to have jobs and people living around train stations, and yet when presented with the same situation, silence on a state level in terms of empowering local government and local councillors. So for me, it's an absolute head-banging issue uh, when, you know, you hear, you know, discussions around removing rights of councillors to have planning, uh, so influence on planning decisions. This is the sort of thing where you kind of want councillors living in these communities to tell the story about what it means. So, yeah, hopefully that answers that. Thank you. It's, it's not straightforward, is it? And, and when decisions about, of, of PSPs are being made, they're being made years decisions about development for years in the future and sometimes, as we know, those of us who've wor working or worked or live in growth area councils know that we can't always retrofit uh, the good, um, you know, infrastructure and urban design um, back into, you know, old decisions. Tom. Yeah, thanks, Josh. Um, you're right about those stations. I look at the Wyndham Vale and the Tarnit station and one of the selling points we know built that we're building a 1,000 car parks around these stations and if you go there now, they're windswept rubbish holes, surrounded by cars and nothing else. And you're right, our most valuable land is the land around, the land around our stations, and yet we make it into free car parking during the day and empty at night time. Mm. So why, why was that sort of planning allowed in your city when it is so disastrous and the only way you can get to the station is to have a car?
it's, it's as you would know as a, a councillor, it's the ability to put in those planning interventions, to have urban design frameworks that say this is what it should be. Uh, you'd be horrified if you go out there nowadays because there's a Bunnings next to that car park and a Starbucks and a Hungry Jacks and that talks so much to the failure of planning in terms of giving council and councillors the capacity to argue is that the type of land use we want right next to a train station. So sometimes, I, you know, when you hear the discussion around livability and you see instances of just total policy failure like that at a catastrophic level, in my opinion, uh, then when you hear about the need for more housing, you kind of look sideways at state politicians when they say these things because they clearly are not connected to what's happening in the outer suburbs and the opportunity cost of the uh, decision to centralise planning powers at a state level at the expense of the communities. Mm. Uh, that are out there. So, look Josh, up, yeah. I'm going to stop you there. Sorry, I'm going to move on to the other two. Um, Eng or Barbin, did you have a comment on that one? I, I just want to provide my own anecdotes from this morning, uh, this afternoon, trying to come here. Uh, wanted to catch a bus. There was a bus, bus coming in 60 minutes' time from Wyndham. Uh, I gave up on that, so I drove my car to a train station, Tarnit Station. Thousand car parks, not a spare one. Went around, went to Williams Landing. 500 plus car parks on the public space, 400 in the private space, not a single car park available. Then I went to Levelton. Levelton was full as well. I drove all the way to Footscray and asked my friend, can I park at your place so that I can jump on a train <laughs> and come to here? Okay, that says it all. Uh, Eng? <laughs> um, I think um, I, I sort of alluded to the Gisborne uh, planning around the train station there. So I think it's part of the uh, well-documented transit-oriented development. I think that's something that we should all aspire to and not to end up the situation where we have uh, Hungry Jags and Bunnings and, and, and those sort of development requires a lot of uh, surface car park and it's just a huge blight to to probably the most uh, so-called valuable real estate next to train station. If you look at other countries, uh, like in Hong Kong or Singapore, they actually do the best development around uh, transport hubs so that, first of all, the residents do not even have to drive. They just take a leaf down and off they go to Hungry Jacks and even uh, small-scale Bunnings. So so that's the sort of planning that we should aspire to. I'm actually surprised that you have to go, the council judge had to go to Supreme, is it Supreme Court, I heard correctly, to, to fight for what you wanted. So that was quite an interesting uh, reveal, yeah. So it was, um, it's in the Supreme Court now, it's a live um, appeal, and it was because VCAT upheld uh, the decision to reject the permit in favour of the underlying mm. principles of the PSP. So it's a really fascinating, it's like a 32-page decision. It's quite, um, in my opinion, precedent-setting around just how important these PSPs are in the outer suburbs. So I'd recommend people have a read if they're yeah. interested. Jump online and have a look. If I, if I can add one point is that a car park can only generate so much uh, so-called spend, as probably Councillor Bennett Thomas, you know, as we look at uh, uh, converting car parks into, uh, during COVID time, into uh, what they call, uh, what's the thing? Uh, uh, shops. Parklets. And there are, there are obviously uh, parklets, sorry, parklets I was looking for. So, so the value of converting precious land instead of using as car park near train station, but more into the transit area development actually gives council and and even the state revenue office much better uh, returns than building a car park. Yeah. We've probably got time for one no. more question. Um, I'm going to ask it. Um, we know that on-demand and flexi-ride services, aren't, they're not going to solve all of our transport no. problems. So what are the kind of what are the outer limits of how how much those these uh, pro projects or services can kind of what's their outer limit for you know servicing? I think you talked about a local area. So what's the where are the limits on that? I guess in a, very, in a very amateur way, I'd say that you pigeonhole two types of people using the service, those that are staying within the city and those that are seeking to get out of it in terms of jobs. Um, and so um, really tailoring to deal with the people that are uh, essentially... Um, I think the, ch the challenge more broadly uh, is if... Funding, first of all, in terms of the services, as I've described, but second of all, uh, how do you look at a more... Like, we're t discussing more about planning than we are bus routes and bus services, unfortunately, but really, how do you create uh, that 15-minute 
20-minute neighbourhood uh, where people are able to stay locally, live locally and work locally. Uh, and the further out you get, uh, you've got circumstances where uh, you know, more people as a proportion of the population are travelling in to get it to work. Uh, and uh, one of the stats that we use uh, to illustrate this problem is residents that are driving in uh, take up to four weeks uh, worth of time sitting in traffic once you add the to and from uh, destination to work and back home. That's your entire annual leave gone. The inverse problem of that discussion is you're kind of talking people out of living in our community as well. So it's a very catch-22. Um, yeah, it's a it's a difficult it's a difficult question. Mm -hmm. One that's uh, got you know many facets to it. Um, but you know, stand alone, do services alone fix the problem? If you increase them, no, because as someone mentioned before, you're pushing the people that are, are seeking to leave the city onto rail. And we've got out of Southern Cross, uh, Wyndham Vale and Tarnit are the busiest V-line stations uh, in the state. Uh, we're talking about millions of passenger uh, transits every year. Uh, and as I mentioned, the population on that train line will career it to a halt because we've got no indication about upgrades in terms of electrification. So that we're getting to a point of having maximum usage of trains on that on the line. So you might increase bus services yep. to get people out only to have them sitting at our train station because they either can't drive there or get a park or indeed they can't get on a train. Thank you. Uh, Barvin, do you want to...? I just want to make a, one comment on that. Um, probably rather than testing the limits of the flexi service, I would say flip the question around when do we start providing a flexi bus service and I would say when when a state start get, gets developing and you have the first resident have a provision for a flexi service, that's a that's a really good start. And as the service demand grows, as the as the more communities sort of getting built, uh, turn those uh, some of those uh, flexi services into a freak, fixed route services. So don't don't in Melton's example, don't wait for eighteen thousand residents to come in before you introduce a flexi service where there's already a huge demand for a fixed route service. Uh, however, I still see a point where, yes, you, you, need, you, you need those on-demand service when you have 100 residents, for example. Mm, yeah, great, yes. I don't Thank think you. you'll get arguments from anyone in this group about putting in the uh, transport service from day one. Uh, Eng, do you want to finish up with it for us? Yeah, I share what Bavin uh, commented about putting the demand responsive transport first. As uh, as the uh, as the new estates uh, gets developed uh, in the initial years, because if you don't bring them in early, the rest the first few residents to move in will have one car and then two car and the other the uh, adult children will have another car when they get work. So we end up with four car family household before the bus service comes in and it's too late on to win them off the four cars once uh, once that happen. Yeah, so that's a bit too late. So I think I do agree with. Bavin's point on that one. The other part about limits is that uh, it's always good to start in areas where uh, it's more rural in nature, where the density does not justify the full service. So that's a good place to come in. Uh, and also, uh, we could be conscious about the demographics in the area, for example, uh, uh, people with disabilities or people who choose not to drive or those who cannot drive. Uh, we should be able to provide that so social equity in terms of access to transport so that they can uh, have a more meaningful life and also access to jobs and, and shops and all that. So I think that's another key consideration from a social equity point of view. Great, thank you. All right, we're done. Thank, we, thank you, I mean, th thank our panel, please, for sharing their expertise with us. Um, and there is one final question from Knowles, who left the room. He wants to know if there's oh. a Collingwood Premiership flag behind you. <laughs> I'm sharing a room with another manager, so he's a big <laughs> fan, and obviously you all know that uh, he's very happy with the outcome in recent finals. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. All right, and uh, so I'll just okay. hand over to Councillor Anna Chen to wrap up the session for us. Thanks. Thank you. As the NTF bus ambassador, it's my pleasure to close today's NTF Love Buses Forum 3, ZEVs and Beyond. And today's program has been part of the NTF advocacy strategy as we look forward 
to a time when buses are seen by all of Melbourne as a vital, effective, efficient, reliable and valuable part of the public transport network. There's no doubt that our bus network needs reform and that there is a demand from the community to deliver improvements. We know from Andy that there will be a 10 years plan to change the bus themselves. The NTF has advocated that ZEP transition is also an opportunity to change the network. We heard from Anthony about how the change was delivered in Auckland over 10 years, which double patronage and what we can learn from the New Zealand experience. Professor Ines Sanchez de Madariga shed lights on the need for planning to catch up with the significant demographic changes over the last 50 years, especially to account for the caring economy as, the paid in, uh, as well as the paid employment and education economy. Dr. Stone has shown us what could be easily be achieved in Melbourne's West to make the network fit for the 21st century. And our three panelists, Councillor Jeff Gilligan, uh, Barvin Matar, and Ang Wing have shown us that bus networks can be welcomed by the growing communities. It has been a great day, and I hope that our speakers have informed and inspired you about the immense potential that could be unlocked by moving bus planning from what we have always done to what our current city and future city will need. Thank you to our partners at the NAV for assisting in the staging of today's forum, including Mel and Shana and Jeff and Emma. Thank you also to my co-host, Councillor Sarah Race, and I know that she has gone to pick up her child. And our EV, of course, Jane Wardock. <laughs> Thank you also to Brad and Greg for the behind the scene operation of the technical aspects of putting the forum together, including live streaming and recording and organize of the event today. Without you, we don't know how we can deal <laughs> with the, the whole event smoothly today. And of course, Huge thank you to our speakers, Andy Cole, Anthony Cross, Professor Ina Sanchez de Madariga, Dr. John Stone, and our panelists, Councillor Jeff Gilligan, and Ng and Barling, Barfing Matar. If you wish to review any of the presentations, they will sh be shortly available up on the MTF website. And on a final note, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, some of our um, member councils have uh, declared Monday, 23rd October to, 20, uh, to Friday, 27th October to be Bus Awareness Week. And the purpose of this campaign is to highlight the role of buses in connecting Melbourne. Councils are participating in a variety of local activities, including mayors and MPs on buses, try the bus events, and of course, better buses, uh, better buses online survey. Uh, MTF has prepared a survey for the community to share how they currently use buses and their ideas about how to improve the services. Uh, please take the NTF Better Buses survey. They are available on ntf.org.au slash buses. You can see the screen, uh, the screen there on the left-hand side of the screen. Take the survey. The survey responses will help the NAV and your own council to advocate for better bus services. So I uh, encourage everyone to take about one or two minutes to, uh, to finish the survey. Thank you very much. And I hope you all have enjoyed today's program as much as I have. And thank you very much again. Give yourself a round of applause. Thank you.